Well, welcome to map making in 2021. Let's get ready. We'll take a few minutes for folks to join us. Um, and Jen is actually going to kick us off. This is Jen Miller from the League of Women Voters. Um, and we're so happy to have her with us today. And she's going to kick us off and get us started. And then she'll wrap us up at the end. So you get a Jen Miller sandwich this evening with stuff about maps in the middle, which is the good stuff. Um, so we'll give it about a minute, I think, before we'll start. But I am so thrilled that we are all together. It's nothing like the Fair District's family. I would encourage you to throw in where you are from. So there's a, there's a chat function that's here. And so welcome. It would be, be nice to know where folks are. Um, so if you throw in your name and you just say, hey, I'm from, for example, Dublin, um, I, you know, throw in, throw in where you're from and, and put it into the chat and welcome. We're so glad you're joining us. Wow, look at this. Wow. I'm so glad so many of you are here with us. Look at this. We're covering all, all of Ohio. And I noticed that somebody actually is paying attention from Cambodia. That's so cool. Exactly. Worthington and Wood County and Athens. Newark and Cleveland and Medina, Westerville, Westchester, Pennsylvania. That's so great. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, welcome to this program, uh, which is literally the stuff we're going to talk about was made possible by all of you. Um, many of you know better than myself all the work that League and Common Cause have done together for decades in our state to bring fair maps to the people. Um, this is, we are fiercely nonpartisan. This is not about securing seats for parties at all. Um, what we want is a representative map, a map that is responsive to the will of the people. So when voters and voter preferences change, that we see changes to those districts and those maps. Um, so we're going to hear a little bit about the history, uh, a little bit about um, how uh, gerrymandering has affected everyday Ohioans, like all of us, um, and a little bit about what our plans are for this year. But please understand this is just a toe dip. Um, we will have lots and lots of programming uh, starting early in 2021 throughout the entire year. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to talk about the agenda really quickly. Um, the agenda is tight on purpose. We're going to give you lots, oops, lots of little snippets. Um, quickly, uh, I am thrilled that we will have uh, Dr. David Niven, and I will introduce him in a minute, um, really talking to us from an academic perspective in terms of what the consequences have been for everyday Ohioans. We're going to hear from a couple of our Fair Districts volunteers who helped bring uh, the reforms to the people. First, Rita Kipp. Then we will hear from the incomparable Mia Lewis, who will talk about why citizen map making is important. Um, we'll have a quick uh, conversation about mapping software and what mapping software might be available um, as we think about map contests and, and um, just overall um, being uh, participating in the map process. So pleased to have another Fair Districts volunteer Desiree Futel from the Cincinnati area. Catherine's going to give us an, a timeline and overview of what we expect to be the timeline for map making as well as all of our activities. And then um, we'll wrap it up again. So really quickly, Dr. Niven um, had got his PhD actually from The Ohio State University. He teaches um, politics at the University of Cincinnati. He's published several books as well as in several um, academic peer-reviewed journals. I first got to see Dr. Niven's work um, during the gerrymandering trial where I just really was 
uh, inspired by the way that he could use data and analysis to explain the very real world impacts of redistricting and specifically partisan gerrymandering. Um, he was an expert witness and just an incredible storyteller. And so at this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Niven. Well, thank you, Jen. And, and thanks to our entire audience for joining us here today. You know, we all have seen the map and we know that it's a, you know, it's a beast and, and it, it doesn't quite look like any other map we've ever encountered in any other context. And I just want to give a little bit of substance to that. I don't know if my uh, first slide is, uh, is coming back here, but <clears throat> we have a sense as Ohioans that our map is extraordinary. And, you know, we have a sense of a lot of things about Ohio are extraordinary, but I want to assure you, we're right. Our map is extraordinary by any means, by any measure. Um, here's one number. And you know, I know you can be overwhelmed. Here's, here's the slide uh, with the title, your own personal congressional district. I know when we look at the entirety of the state, we see shapes and we say, that's odd. Why is it like that? Well, I think it's actually even odder when you zoom in to the realities of our congressional districts. This is 5800 Renner Road. It's on the west side of Columbus near the Hilliard border. And you notice that these fine folks go out their door say hello to their next door neighbor on the left. They leave the 15th district and they enter the third. They go out their door to say hello to their next door neighbor on the right. They leave the 15th district and they enter the third as if they have their own congressional district. Why, what is this about? And you know, here's one number. And again, I know we can be overwhelmed by stats but here's one number for you. Between the last map and this map, between Ohio's last map you know, 20 years ago and the map that was drawn 10 years ago, there was a 60% increase, a 60% increase in the number of neighborhoods that were divided between multiple congressional districts. There's no reason that you had to, you know, draw this map house by house and create those zigzaggy lines through neighborhoods, other than when you draw a map that precisely, you make it more predictable. And that was the point of the map to make the outcomes predictable. Now let's look at the next slide here. Did it work? Was it predictable? Think about this. 10 years, 16 districts, not a single one changed hands. Not a single seat moved from Democratic to Republican or Republican to Democratic in 10 years. The map is undefeated. Now that's so extraordinary on so many different levels. But let me give you just a couple of examples of other states. Kansas has four seats in the House, not Ohio 16, they have four. Kansas, Kansas had seats switch from one party to another. Nebraska has three seats in the House, not Ohio 16. Nebraska had seats that switched from one party to another. Maine, Maine has two seats, two seats. It has uh, districts to switch from one party to another. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. I think one could say this was, and now here we're talking not impressions, but just cold hard data. This was the most severe gerrymander in the nation, and it had its intended effect, total predictability. Now, let me show you on this last slide, part of why we care. You know, the Supreme Court has kind of, you know, furrowed its brow and said, well, you know, who's gerrymandered really? And what is it? You know, what difference does it make? What even is it? And on this last slide, this is an example of where gerrymandering research is going. And this is some of the work that I'm doing personally. It actually, in concrete ways, affects people's access to representation. And here's one example. In Ohio today, for 3.6 million Ohioans, 3.6 million, if they were to go out from their home today and go to the closest congressional district office to go and share an opinion or ask for help, if they walked out the door and went to the closest congressional district office, they'd be in the wrong district and their member would send them home uh, and that member would send them home. 
That's what gerrymandering is. The map that you can see on the right side of the screen, everyone in yellow, their closest congressional district office is the wrong district. And the reason that happens, of course, is when you draw these absurdly shaped districts, you create these odd perimeters and open the door. You open the door for this. This is this is not theoretical. This is not, well, who, you know, who could potentially ever even ever be hurt by gerrymandering? This is it. This is concrete. Imagine how offensive it would be if you said to 3.6 million Ohioans, if you want to write to Congress, you have to put two stamps on the letter. Everybody else can do one. Imagine how how much that would offend us to our core that you would say our representation was minimized that way. Well, this isn't two stamps. It's a good deal more. You know, for many people, they are tens, you know, uh, uh, tens of, of greater miles away, you know, hours greater away, effectively curtailing representation. And it's just one example. So what I just want to underscore for folks is we have a sense that Ohio's map is uniquely, uh, uniquely perversely gerrymandered, and we're exactly right about it. And that has consequences for our representation. Thank you for that. Dr. Niven, I have a question. Can you talk about the how the census plays a role and specifically how population loss might have been an excuse for gerrymandering and how we might lose another seat again? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Of course, the census is, is the base of all the data for how many people we have and, and the beginning point of drawing these districts. Um, Ohio is almost certain to lose a congressional district from our current map to the next one, not because we shrank, but because we're not growing as fast as some other states. So effectively, seats shift to wherever the fastest population growth is. Now, in terms of, well, do you have to gerrymander because you lost a seat? Absolutely not. There are lots of examples. New York would be one where they lost seats from the last map to the current map, but actually did less of that splitting of neighborhoods, drew fewer of those zigzaggy lines. So this was, you know, this was a choice. It was a strategy. And again, it was a, a astonishingly effective one to have this map retire undefeated. How about, you know, especially because you're talking about the congressional map, and I know that's what you have done the most research on. Can you talk about how the 2018 reforms that uh, we helped get onto the ballot and passed, what might make this map look different? Well, fundamentally, the very beginning point is to discourage the, the wanton, needless splitting of towns and counties. I mean, that's really where it starts. If you can, can split, and you can see on your screen the, the, the crazy shape that was imposed on Franklin County, and you can see on your screen perhaps the even crazier shape that was imposed on Summit County. You know, if you can do that without limit, without any discouragement, then you can really draw the congressional district of your dreams. You can really draw a congressional district that will do exactly what you created it to do. The more that you have to accept natural boundaries, the more you have to accept people's decisions and preferences rather than imposing an outcome on them. You know, that, that it's that degree of control. If you have precise control, you can make more uh, predictable outcomes. If the system and the new reforms discourage the splitting of counties, right there, forget about every other piece of it, that right there is an extraordinary move toward fair districts. Can you talk about the snake on the lake? So uh, <laughs> just give us some stories about the snake on the lake and how different, you know, various parts of that district are and how hard that might be for a congressperson to represent the various needs of those constituents. Well, you look at the snake on the lake up there, no, district number nine, you know, first of all, it's, it's a walk on water district. To really get from one end of it to the other, you're going to have to be able to walk on water. It was created even basically to put Marcy Kaptur and, and Dennis Kucinich in the same district. So one would defeat the other. You know, how, you know, how odd a shape and how odd a, a conglomeration is it? You know, my favorite fact, and, and it's one that Ohioans will understand implicitly, the folks who live on the western edge of that district 
are seven times more likely to root for the University of Michigan football team than the folks who live on the eastern edge of that district. This is not a natural place. This is not a naturally connected district. And, and it really gets at the heart of representation. And you can see that across Ohio. Even if you're an extraordinary representative and you care deeply what your constituents think and feel and want and need, there's no way to represent some of these places. Steve Stivers in the 15th represents some of the richest, most educated, most you know, uh, 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 economically advantaged areas of the state. And he also represents some of the poorest, some of the folks who you know, most desperately need a government response to their circumstances. Even if he wants to, he can't represent the breadth of that district because the district, you know, uh, has little, if not anything at all in common. Thank you for that. Um, how, can you talk about how long it might take someone to, well, let's talk a little bit more about that 3.6 million. Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit more? I think a lot of Ohioans don't feel represented, right? I feel like they, wonder why they should call their Congress member about an issue. Can you just go a little bit more into other examples of sure. how representation is weakened when partisan gerrymandering occurs? You know, here's a great example. And, and this is something that we're getting more and more great research about. When you look at a Franklin County or a Summit County or any of these places where we've imposed extra splits on, one of the things we're finding is those folks are less likely to know who their member of Congress is. So even at the most basic level of, you know, sharing an opinion or holding someone accountable, you know, voting for them if they do what you want and voting against them if they don't. Well, the more you split a town or a county, the less likely those people are to know who represents them. So they can't possibly hold that person accountable. And so, you know, that's one of the most fundamental things that we see with gerrymandering. It, it creates confusion. And think about those folks at 5800 Renner Road. They, they leave their house and they see all these yard signs for congressional candidates. Those are congressional candidates they can't vote for. And that's, that's the essence of it. How could they not be confused if every, everybody you see has, you know, has the same affiliation for a congressional district? And you know, let me give you one great Ohio example you know, that gets at the heart of this. You know, we had a special election in the 12th district uh, in 2018, member of Congress uh, resigned and, and we had that special election. On election day, the special election day, thousands of people in Franklin County, thousands of people on that special election called the Board of Elections and said, why isn't my polling place open? I want to vote in the special election. And of course, the simple answer was, your polling place isn't open because you don't live in the 12th district, which they didn't know, which is exactly what I'm saying. You know, what, what gerrymandering helps foster is that just basic confusion, which is a direct foe of representation. We're getting all these stories in the chat, Dr. Niven. So, you know, Lydia saying that her congressman's email doesn't actually recognize her zip code as being <laughs> his district. Mm -hmm. um, others just saying that um, their lawmaker will not meet with them. Um, they feel that this has to do with partisan gerrymandering. Can you just really, you are a storyteller ultimately, in my opinion. Can you talk about why storytelling is so, is gonna be so important in your opinion this year as we try to tackle the problem of gerrymandering in Ohio? Well, absolutely. I, I think it's so easy to get, you know, overwhelmed by the data and overwhelmed by, you know, the fact that you literally could draw a map in an infinite number of ways. So, you know, to start with that and say, well, this is too complicated for me to understand. But no, it's not too complicated for you to understand. We have to create districts that are meaningful. And when we do that, we allow people to be heard. And, you know, your example from the chat is a fantastic one. And this happens to far too many Ohioans. There's a family in Cincinnati whose house literally, if they're in, the, the living room of their house, they're in the first district. If they're in the bedroom in their house, they're in the second district. And for a while, um, the Board of Elections in Hamilton County and the US Congress disagreed about which district the people you know, should be assigned to because the line literally cuts through their house. And there's a reason why their 
burdened with that. And it's the same reason why the folks at 5800 Renner Road can't, you know, can't go out the door and talk to their neighbor about their member of Congress. And, and that is what was what was advantaged in this process. It wasn't creating sensible districts. It wasn't creating compact districts. You know, it wasn't creating, you know, districts that represent real places. You know, what was advantaged was precision and predictability. And, you know, that's great. <laughs> that's great for political uh, consultants. They know, they know exactly which districts they can win and which ones they can't. It's terrible for political constituents because it's, it's a total disruption of the connections that they should have. This has been a great conversation. Dr. Niven, I know we're going to have you back because there's so much more research and storytelling you can do. Folks um, at home, we will be uh, sending you instructions on how to watch this video. We'll be getting you these slides. And we want to hear your questions because, again, we're going to be doing public education and events like this all year long. And so we want to know what you want to know. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Niven, for your time. And I look forward to working with you more in the upcoming year. My pleasure. Uh, Glad to be here with you. Next, I want to uh, introduce, uh, I believe next we have Mia. And I just want to say, who is it? Yeah, go ahead. It's Rita, is it not? Oh, it's Rita. Yeah, so Rita. Um, I would like to introduce Rita um, from uh, Licking County League and uh, who really, our Licking County League came out of the fair districts work. She's going to give us, a, we want to hear not just from the experts, but our everyday Ohioans who've been, you know, out there in the field um, fighting gerrymandering. Thanks. You know, the reason I'm passionate about gerrymandering is <clears throat> I see it as a form of voter suppression. It virtually guarantees that a specific party will win or lose the race in that specified district, as Dr. Niven pointed out. And in Ohio, 10 years ago, they were drawn in such a way that the predictability of the you know, 12 uh, Republican districts winning Republican voters and four uh, districts winning Democrat voters has just been you know, almost 100%. And so who wins is a foregone conclusion. And this leaves voters, regardless of party, feeling that whether or not they vote, it really doesn't matter. Everyone knows how the race is going to turn out in that district. In Licking County, uh, the push to change this really took place in the summer of uh, 2017. And it was organized through Indivisible 12 East, not the League of Women Voters, which did not exist at that point. Subsequently, a lot of the people who gathered uh, signatures in this uh, initiative joined the League of Women Voters. But at the time, it was Indivisible 12 East that carried the ball. We worked on the four-day festival at the 4th of July in Granville that draws thousands of people every year. We took that petition home to our families, to our neighbors. Uh, we worked a lot of libraries. I seem to remember Mia Lewis and I at the Ohio State Fair. Um, so we really worked on this. And uh, I would observe that in 2017, most of the people I talked to in these various settings um, understood at some level that gerrymandering, according to party, is not fair, that it diminishes the value and the weight of people's votes in specific districts. And most were willing to sign. There were, I would say, only two or three times where somebody actually expressed out loud the opinion, well, you know, I'm really okay with the, <laughs> with the way things are now, uh, understanding that as long as their party was advantaged, the gerrymandered status quo was okay. I sometimes wonder what it would be like in 2020 or 2019 to go out there and try to gather signatures for the same kind of petition. I rather suspect that we might more frequently encounter people who willingly embrace partisan gender, gerrymandering. I hope that's not right, but I kind of think it would be. 
At the very least, the recent election highlights just how much commitment and hard work it takes to protect the vote, which is vulnerable to su suppression by many means. We're finally coming to the point where we can see the way to put a fairer process of districting in place in Ohio. And this, if we can do this, will reduce one of the forms of voter suppression. So we have to see this through to the finish. Thanks. Thank you, Rita. And I now wanna turn it over to my dear friend, Mia Lewis, um, a writer, a musician, a grassroots organizer extraordinaire. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, yeah, so um, what everybody else just said, we I 100% agree with. This is our, our horrible map, and this was what happened in 2011, and we are still suffering the consequences. Um, you can go to the next slide, um, uh, Nazik. So, um, you know, it's not just that one single congressman has to deal with completely different constituencies, but you have this weird stuff like this is, the black line is Cuyahoga County. Now look at that. What if the city of Cuyahoga, of the, what if the city of Cleveland in Cuyahoga County, you know, faces some enormous challenge all of a sudden, and they've got four different congressmen inside their county and two more that are on the periphery. So there's actually in the greater Cleveland area, you've got six entirely different Congress people that are somehow having to get together and, and you know work together to make something work. And if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that this is those same six districts, but you know, they may have a, a, a tip of a toe inside Cuyahoga County, but then they stretch out to these vast expanses outside so that the six districts that are in or around Cuyahoga County actually cover about a quarter of Ohio, which makes absolutely um, uh, no sense whatsoever. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, um, you know, sometimes people think that we have this bad gerrymandering because the reforms that we fought for and we won successfully in 2015 and 2018 were bad, but actually they just haven't kicked in yet because this they the redistricting only happens every 10 years. We did those reforms, but they don't actually take place until the year after the census. So 2020 was the year of the census and 2021 is the year when um, we are going to be um, uh, uh, actually redrawing the lines. So um, uh, we, you know, the, we passed these reforms. You can see all of that's that written there. It was a huge group effort. So many people were involved. And um, you can go to the next slide. Um, we got some reforms. Now, um, sorry, I'm just gonna move my slides along. Yep. Yeah. Um, so these reforms are not perfect. They're not foolproof. But we are still very lucky that we have them. There are some states that are going into redistricting in 2021 with the same bad um, rules that they had in 2011. And we are lucky that we have a, a better situation. Now, this is a kind of a, a, a rough uh, diagram of how the congressional districting redistricting will work in Ohio. You don't need to memorize all of this. We're going to go over this again and again through the year. We're going to have a gerrymandering 101 or redistricting 101 um, talk. We're going to have tutorials about map making. This is just a sneak peek ahead. And the important thing um, to see about this is that we have these guardrails in place. So the new system, um, you can go to the next slide, the new, the new system that we have, it reigns in the worst excesses of gerrymandering through new requirements. It has requirements for bipartisan map making. That's in those first three kind of uh, stages or, or um, you know, opportunities to try to do a map. It requires greater transparency and it also requires giving Ohioans tools to make their own maps and participate more fully in map making. Um, so we have public hearings are required um, and um, uh, 
the, the redistricting is emphasizes counties as political building blocks, such that um, of Ohio's 88 counties, at least 65 have to be contained entirely within one district. So no split in 65 counties. Only one split is allowed in up to 18 counties, hopefully far fewer than 18. Um, and two splits are allowed in five counties. And if if the first three attempts at map making don't work in those first three columns and we go all the way to the fourth, then there would be stricter requirements protecting against drawing district lines that favor or disfavor political parties, candidates, or incumbents. So there are additional um, strict rules that apply um, if we get all the way uh, to the end. Um, you can move to the next uh, uh, slide. So, <clears throat> um, Why are we, you know, we're talking about um, map making here. What is our job? I know that you guys are here because you're ready to get to work. We've got 370 people, um, you know, with us here tonight and many more who are going to receive these slides and this recording. Why are you all here? I know you're here because you really care and because you're ready to roll up your sleeves and get to work. And our job is going to be to be watchdogs and to hold the legislators and the redistricting commission um, to hold them accountable because um, we want to realize the promise of the reforms that we fought for and that we won. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do it through public pressure campaigns. We're going to do it through public education and raising awareness. We're going to fight for transparency because we know that the last time they drew those maps, they drew it in a secret bunker and they, you know, no more secret bunkers. It's going to be um, a transparent process. We're going to uh, fight for transparency and we'll tell you more about this um, both this evening and um, uh, as we go on through the year. But in a, a hugely important part of your role and what you'll be doing is citizen map making. And citizen map making is important because we're going to be splitting communities in new ways. So think of that Cuyahoga County map that I showed you earlier with those four splits in it. We're going to have to draw a line somewhere in there. Well, where should we draw it? And one role that's one job that you guys are going to have this year that's incredibly important is learning to identify, describe, delineate, and actually map your community so we know what's a good split and what's a bad. We, we can present in a public hearing what makes sense as a community and what doesn't. And we can present a fair nonpartisan map that abides by all the rules, uh, the new rules um, for redistricting in Ohio. We can showcase the good maps. We can challenge and call out the bad maps if they're presented. And if it's actually necessary, we can bring these to court um, and show that we that there are better maps, many, many better maps than the ones um, that have officially been um, presented. And you can go to my last slide. Um, so just to say that, you know, this is a, a this is happening nationwide and we're going to focus here on, on Ohio, but we have a lot of national resources. There are um, the Tufts um, MGGG redistricting lab is helping us with software and expertise. Brennan Center, the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. Na a Common Cause National has fantastic resources for us, including map making. And this is all just one very long winded introduction to introduce you to the Common Cause National Map Making team who are gonna join us right now. Um, Dan, Suzanne and, and Alex are gonna join us and give us a little sneak peek um, into some of the software that we can use to draw our communities and to draw our state um, and to create better maps. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mia. Um, I'm gonna kick it off and then toss it over to Dan Vicuña who's actually going to do the fun part and walk you through the software. But I want to talk a little bit about kind of our approach at Common Cause to mapping, right? Um, we've talked a lot about districts today. We've talked a lot about counties and district lines. And I know there are tons of questions in the chat about metrics and statistical measures, but I kind of want to break it down and take a step back uh, from that and talk about communities, right? So when we're talking about what makes a map good, what makes a map fair, what makes a map representative, it's about how those communities are represented in that map. And you know, the, the technical term is community of interest, but really it's just our communities, where we live, our neighborhoods, right? So when I talk about like my neighborhood, I live in Pennsylvania, I live in Harrisburg, 
Um, I talk about the farmer's market and I talk about the theater that's across the street and I talk about the coffee shop down the block and the fact that we're all concerned about funding for schools, right? And making sure our community garden gets enough area. Um, and so it's about kind of telling the story of our community. So Ohio has an amazing opportunity this year to really increase the transparency of the, the redistricting process and give folks the opportunity to tell their story. And so that's what we're gonna talk about kind of here, right? Is the ability to tell the story. So Common Cause National has been working with the amazing team uh, from MGGG, Tufts University led by Moon Duchin. Um, and they have created uh, this software called District R um, that really, it allows you you can draw districts if you want to draw districts, but I think it's more like my, the thing I'm most excited about is the ability to map our communities, right? So this isn't about making sure that population is equal. It isn't about making sure that we're complying with the VRA. It's about telling the story of who we are and where we live and who lives around us. Um, and then taking that story and being able to present it to the map makers, right? Because that's really the gap. Um, you know, you can talk to your neighbors and, or say a cousin coming from out of town and say like, this is why where I live is cool. Um, this is where I'm concerned about my neighborhood. Um, but when it comes to time to like testify or create that story for the people who are actually going to be drawing and um, voting on the maps, and then also give you an ability to kind of evaluate whether a map is good or not. Um, that's often a gap. So our hope is that this particular tool, and it's one of a number of tools out there, but this is a partnership that Common Cause has with the MGDG team. And we work closely with them to develop a curriculum. Um, we're not going to go through the whole thing today, but it, it has a train the trainers portion. So it really walks folks through kind of how to tell the story of who they are and where they live and why protecting their community is so important. Um, and so with that, I think I'm going to toss it to Dan Vicuña. Dan, you want to take it away? Yeah, hey, thanks. So I, I wanted everybody to make sure you got a chance to meet Suzanne because she's likely to be the main uh, liaison to Ohio. Uh, we, I'm, I'm based near, uh, near Los Angeles. She's in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So geographically, she's going to be, uh, be your champion in the national team. So uh, but anyways, uh, so I wanted to also introduce Alexandra Leal Silva, who's going to help me a demo district. Alex, if you want to say hi, and uh, she's a new member to our team and what you're going to do for us. Hi, folks. My name is Alexandra Leal Silva. As Dan said, I'm stationed over in between Los Angeles and San Diego here in California, and I am the team's research and communications consultant. So I work on making everything look nice and make sense. And so that no matter what level you are, whether you're just entering the redistricting conversation or you've been in it for years, there is information that can help you in your efforts to create fair redistricting in your area. Awesome. So with that, uh, once you share your screen, we're going to dive into the, the software. Um, so my understanding is that there, you know, there's some interest in Ohio and in, in looking at both an option for uh, drawing full, do on full on map making, drawing statewide districts, uh, congressional or state legislative, uh, and also organizing to do community mapping. So um, we're going to start by taking a look at the community mapping side. And Catherine is going to uh, be our pretend community organization from Columbus. Um, so you start at the beginning of the software, you know, looking at a map of the US and uh, you go to Ohio um, and you'll see um, after Alex clicks on that, uh, you, you'll have a sort of fork in the road, either drawing districts or communities. Um, so we'll start with communities and we'll go ahead and use uh, block groups for that. And so what we'll, we'll have proceeded, you know, for about 10 or 15 minutes uh, in the way we envision this kind of training community effort to go is that we would have had um, a process of really um, having a community group describe, as Suzanne mentioned, their communities. You know, what are the uh, kind of important landmarks, the places that make uh, their neighborhood their neighborhood, be that uh, park space, shopping areas, um, you know, local schools, if there's a university that's the center of activity nearby. Um, uh, so to start with that, so let me just briefly before we, we dive in, I'll look at some of the um, some of the tools we're going to use as part of the software. So this is this is 
all really user friendly. Um, you know, it has a very kind of a Google Maps vibe. Uh, you know, you have you use the hand function to kind of drag the map around. You can zoom in or out with uh, the plus and minus up in the top left hand corner. Um, the second icon up there on the top right is gonna, the upside down teardrop is um, you know, what's used to sort of drop uh, important landmarks, which we'll, we'll talk through with Catherine. Um, right next to that is a painting function where we'll move from uh, the landmarks to actually marking out a community using census blocks um, as, the, uh, as the building blocks. Um, and so, so anyway, so those are the main things for drawing a community and we'll dive into some of the other tools after we get, we get in there. But uh, Catherine, you, you around to, uh, to experiment with us? I'm ready. All right. I'm happy to be the guinea pig today. Absolutely, sounds great. Uh, so first of all, tell us where you live. Oh, 394 East Town Street. Oh, all right, sorry, I meant the city, but yeah, if you wanna go, let's go right to let's Oh, okay. Right to it. I, <laughs> you wanna give away your, your address and all your spam mail, all your- uh... Just so you all know, this is an office address that I'm giving. <laughs> I consider it my home because I spend that much time there. Like but... Go or, for it, Alex. Yeah. Go ahead and plug that in. Sorry. Could you could you repeat it? Three nine four East Town Street. So again, like Google Maps, you you know you'll see either a particular address. Um, in some cases, a neighborhood. You know you can plug that in. So let's talk about sort of what's nearby. You know we would you know what kind of recreate the uh, the conversation about you know important landmarks you know schools the park space you know what kind of makes that community uh really an important you know uh, what makes an important part of your community so i think if if you work your way um to the east you will find there's a lovely topiary park if you go further east you will find the health department if you kind of go east but like um, let's say let's northeast. You find the Columbus Museum of Art. So let's do let's do one at a time so we can kind of show the, Sorry. Show the function. So give me one. Yeah, what's your what's your favorite? What's the most important place? Oh, let's go let's go all the way over to the health department. Okay, you want you, add, you let's see is that mm, all right? Is that is that it? <laughs> no, it looks like the different city. Oh, this is the other the other part of the world apparently. <laughs> all right work our way back. We can do it. We can do it by official name or if you want to just go back to sort of dragging it by what Catherine has to say, the more description of where it is. So let's just go back to Columbus and All right, take us take us which way to go, Catherine. Okay, could you um, from 394 East Town, could you work your way wait work your way east? And you're going to be, so I'm experiencing the old eyes thing. Does anybody else have this too, where you're like, I can't quite see as well as I should? Well, that's all right. We can, you know, we can do just since the Columbus State Community College is nearby. Let's, let's put, let's oh, make yes. that thing. That sounds like a good plan. Okay. So let, let just as an example. So what, what uh, Alex is going to do is move over to the, the second icon there where you, where you drop a, a landmark, and so she can make can drop a, spa, a, a spot on Columbus State College. You can name it uh, whatever, whatever with whatever makes sense. And underneath there, you can kind of describe like what you know. Why is it important to the community? And so, you know what you know what makes sense, Catherine. What's kind of a useful description for? So I think a useful description is you know that we're a community that values education, and this is a community college, and it's really important to provide this kind of help. My friend John Gaddis just threw in the, the, the address of the public health department to give you on, on that one as well. Uh, okay. So, you know, I think if we look, if we think about um, the uh, Columbus State is across the, basically across the street from the, the museum. Mm -hmm. Also, like when I think of this, this community, especially, I think about the fact that there, you know, there are high High points because of the education, and there's also uh, also high points because of the lovely art that we have there too. Mm -hmm. All right, so I see that we're actually we're already at a, at our about ten minute points. So let let so imagine you've had this conversation with a community group that's identified who knows five, ten, fifteen spots around the city that represent kind of important landmarks in in that that particular community. I think the more localized this community organization is, the better. So what we're going to then move to, so pretend that these spots are all, are, are all over the place. We're going to move to the painting function just to, to 
to move to kind of move things along. Um, and so what we start with is filling in, you know, the spots that were identified. So the address of, of the office, uh, you know, pretend it's sort of somebody's home. And the conversation that might ensue, you know, among the group is, you know, is that East Town Street Historic District, you know, any uh, to the northeast of that? Is that a, also part of the community? You know, maybe yes, maybe no. We'll say yes in this case. Makes a nice kind of pretty square. And then, and additionally, you might say, well, you know, actually, honestly, you know, once you kind of get um, south of that, is that the 70 or is that 7 East? Oh, the I-70. You're like, oh, actually, you know, that's not really the same community. So you might change, so you can change the color up on the top right. Um, and there, there's kind of a numerous colors and you can sort of decide, well, no, you know, some of those spots, you know, that's more kind of the other community. It's like, you may be more residential, you know, for or more suburban feeling, whatever the case may be. Uh, and once you do that, um, thanks, Alex is recreating a bunch of uh, imaginary communities. Um, and so once you've kind of done that, you can then look to, uh, you know, you name them, describe them. And this is all information that'll be captured for decision makers. If you kind of choose to use even just the link that we're going to show you, you can create um, as the thing you hand over to map makers. Um, so you can also look to, uh, you can also add in layer and demographic information. Um, you know, we can look at uh, what the, yeah, whatever a particular uh, racial uh, profile, uh, either using kind of shaded colors or circles, which might be easier to see when you're overlaying it uh, with colors. Um, and so, and then once you kind of, you know, you can kind of give you a sense for maybe where different ethnic communities are, you can also evaluate um, these neighborhoods you've created. So go ahead, Alex, move to the evaluation portion. And you can see demographic information about how uh, the communities you've created uh, really compare to Ohio. You know, as you can see, um, this is a little, you know, downtown Columbus, this blue neighborhood you've created is a little, uh, has slightly more people of color, higher black community. Um, so that's kind of, you know, kind of helpful to know. Um, once you've done this work, uh, you can also save it as it is and share it. Uh, th basically, it create, this generates a URL that freezes this work in time. Um, so you, it'll always be just these communities you've created. But you can also send that URL to other people you're collaborating with uh, so that they can add to it and build on it. Um, this event code right below is something you can use to uh, help to organize uh, groups that might be all over the state or even all over the city, whatever the case may be. You can work with the team at Tufts to create a name, you know, they'd be that, uh, you know, Fair Maps Coalition or whatever, you know, whatever you want to name it or how, how whatever is appropriate for how expansive it is. And then they will help kind of collect that information in one place if you want to use that um, for testimony. So that's the very quick version of the, the community mapping. Let me really even more quickly switch over to the, the district drawing. Um, and we'll and I, and you know, Dave, try not to you're, go. You're okay to take a few more minutes. If you want. All right, okay. Um, so, so anyways, it's a really great tool, um, you know, and the, you know, the, um, the team at Tufts is really preparing a lot of interesting kind of tools to you know, maybe use heat maps to see, you know, what words are people describing over and over again for, you know, a particular neighborhood, you know, so that just an additional um, kind of tool to help you really organize uh, the most effective testimony um, possible to give to decision makers. So uh, really kind of focusing on a bottom up process. Um, so this is, so the mapping side of things, I know there's some interest again in kind of doing statewide mapping in Ohio. Um, it has a lot of the si similar tools. Um, what it adds in is if you, um, a, uh, on, as you can see on the right, it shows for whatever districts you want to draw, we've decided to do congressional districts, what the ideal district size is, what you have to try to aim for um, in terms of appropriate population. Um, so this will kind of keep you, um, uh, you kind of keep you within the bounds of the Constitution. So you see that blue area is sort of heavily overpopulated at this point. So you have to, you know, if you can use the eraser function to kind of pull that population down close to the 721,034 uh, of this census cycle, uh, the MGGG team is waiting for um, new census data. And once that comes in, um, we'll know what the appropriate population um, number is for uh, every level of districts um, going forward after this new data. So we're using we're using the old population numbers now, but um, they'll figure it out, uh, figure out the appropriate number um, for next decade. Um, you know, same deal. You have other, also data layers to examine demographic information about the districts you've drawn. Um, 
and you know, just find out about kind of, again, sort of break ramp breakdowns of different communities. And you can see, you know, if there are, is there a heavily Latino community in one part of the city that you may want to keep whole in, in a way that you didn't during your initial crack at, at drawing districts and, um, you know, that might make sense. So, um, and it also has the same share functions to, to kind of collaborate uh, with other folks so they can build on your work. So, um, one last thing, um, because there, there's possibly interest in kind of mapping, uh, maybe mapping competition, having groups of folks um, submitting, we, we can also work with the team at Tufts to put together sort of a, an Ohio specific page, or even if you're doing a competition for just, um, you know, the best districts, you know, in a certain county, um, this is, the, the team can put together a, a page for that specifically. Um, this is a page that was built for um, folks at uh, University of North Carolina, Asheville. Um, there's a competition to draw uh, a county um, districts and you can see it's kind of laid out nicely where they've put all the, all the different plan submissions, uh, which are really different from each other, um, all on one page to give people, you know, a chance to kind of compare and contrast. So. Um, lots of cool bells and whistles um, for this software. The best part of it is it's um, really user friendly. Um, and we, we've been really grateful to be able to collaborate with the team at Tufts to, uh, to make it as sort of uh, people centered and easy to use as possible. So that's it in a nutshell, or maybe a little more than a nutshell. But thanks for your patience. So I know we are running tight on time. I have two final thoughts, if that's all right. I'm looking at oh, please. Yeah. There, John. Okay. So, number one, first of all, please play with this software. Um, it is free. You can start playing with it now. You can get really good at it. So once um, it's time for you all to go out into your communities and conduct community mapping, you are all the experts. Um, and if there are things that you have questions on, please consider the Common Cause team uh, technical experts. If we don't know the answer, which we may not know the answer, we can get you that answer. Um, so that's number one. And number two is I really want to talk just very briefly about the difference between, it's popping up a lot in the chat, so I wanna address it, between the difference between districts and communities, right? So there is a lot of, uh, when we're thinking about districts, right? There's a lot of criteria that go into creating a district. It has to be compact, it has to be contiguous, it has to, uh, you know, equal population to every other district, which depending on which district you're talking to can be plus or minus 1% or more. Um, it has to, you know, in certain areas comply with the Voting Rights Act. It, you know, so there's a lot of different pieces that go into this. That's not what we're talking about. That was the second half of the presentation, right? When we clicked out and clicked back in. The first half, when we're talking about just mapping your community, that's about telling a story. That's not in a, that's not a place where we want to um, put judgments on whether a community is right or wrong or whether someone's opinions about their community is inclusive enough, right? It's just about capturing that data and capturing that story. Um, so we're not gonna be looking to necessarily, you know, mapping communities doesn't necessarily translate into them being in the final map, but it allows us to look at that final map and say, hey, this community in central Cleveland is split. Why is it split and can we do something about that? Um, so it's about you know, giving us tools to ask questions of the final maps and to advocate for our communities to stay together. But I do want to address that because it was popping up a lot and I know that that's, there's often a tension as we're talking about this. The other one that's popping up, and I'm sorry, Catherine, I know you're supposed to do the questions, but the other one that's popping up is equal population and what that really means. So could one of you kind of break that down a little bit and yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, the, the, so the U.S. Constitution requires that pot, so that districts of the same type um, must have equal numbers of residents in it. You know, it's it's because if you have population shifts during the decade and the census, you know, in, in the census we discover that you know districts are kind of have really different populations. A district that has much fewer people in it um, has kind of more political power in the halls of yeah, uh, you know, in in Congress or state legislature, whatever the case may be. So to ensure that people who a community of uh, two communities of equal population have the same uh, number of representatives in, at whatever level, city council, state legislature, Congress, uh, you want to guarantee that uh, boundaries are moved around every ten years uh, to ensure that those districts have the same uh, same population in them. 
So I do have a few questions. So there's some general kinds of questions. Um, and one had to do with Rucho v. Common Cause. Um, just like what happened with the Supreme Court? What happened with the Supreme Court? And why isn't it that gerrymandering is just illegal? Do I get to do this, Suzanne? Do you want to do sure. it? Sure. You know what? You do it. <laughs> I'll take this bullet. Um, so in Rucho v. Common Cause, the Supreme Court essentially said, hey, it's not our problem. Uh, we as the Supreme Court don't have the ability to answer this question because it is political. Um, and we know that gerrymandering has been part of our political DNA since forever and ever and ever. Uh, and the Supreme Court essentially said like, hey, it's just part of politics. If you wanna fix it, you can. States, you know, they had a shout out to states and say like, hey, states have the ability to fix and put some rules on this, but we're not gonna dig into partisan gerrymandering. And you know, to be clear, racial gerrymandering, still against the constitution, still can't do that. Um, but political gerrymandering and partisan gerrymandering is part of just you know the way our politics work, which is why the work that you all did in Ohio is so incredibly impactful and powerful because you are changing the foundations of the political system in your state. And that means a lot. Yeah, I'll just make one one brief oh. addendum to that. Like shortly after the Russo decision came down, when the federal when the U.S. Supreme Court punted on behalf of all federal courts, uh, we had we won a victory in North Carolina challenging partisan gerrymandering under the state constitution there, which was the second time that's happened. It happened in Pennsylvania a year earlier. So we're looking at that as a litigation option. But um, yeah. So now I have another very general question: um, What's up with the census? Um, it looks like there's going to be a delay in the delivery of population data, the population data that um, is necessary for states to do redistricting. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the schedule for redistricting is, requirements are for Ohio, my apologies. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the, it, it appears there's going to be some delay. The Census Bureau has suggested that they may be able to send their data to the president um, in late January, early February. Um, and that'll push some deadlines back by a few months. Okay, so this is the other question. Um, is the software that you showed us open source? Yeah. And, um, and then the next question really, ha really had to do with what do you think about some of the other, you know, like days redistricting, uh, some of the other tools, and why did you choose this specific one? Um, I think they all have, uh, you know, they all have pluses and minuses depending on kind of what you're comfortable with. I mean, there are some that have um, a lot more kind of sophisticated measurement tools built in, um, you know, about partisan fairness and compactness and stuff like that. Um, I think that, you know, the Tufts team came to us very early on knowing that we're an organization of, of organizers, of people who are used, used to working with community um, activists and, and uh, so that's how they've tried what, what they've tried to center in the creation of this software that it's not for kind of demographers, um, you know, sitting in a room, you know, without sort of thoughts about real world, you know, kind of real communities. It's really about the public having a say. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it, but other tools are really are good, too. They're very, very useful. So it's just it's a matter of, you know, the fact that we've worked with Tess from early on to develop this in, in a good way. So, you know, we have a lot of we, we are coordinating with partners who are using some other software. I think a handful of our states may use some of those, uh, uh, you know, one or two of those other tools, depending on what they need. So, uh, you know, they all, they're all they're all good in some ways. All right. Well, Jen, did you have any other questions? Because I didn't want to cut you off if you did. No, I think we need to continue. I just want to remind everyone that we we are going to we're working on um, having our map contest again. This is just a toe dip. We wanted you to get a sense as to what some of these tools are. I am so um, thrilled and honored to introduce Desiree Futel from the Cincinnati area. She's kind of a Jane of all trades. She has done a lot of different work. She is a hairdresser, but really the way she does hair is more of an art form. Um, and she's done a lot of voter services for the league. She's got two beautiful children and she's gonna talk a little bit more, again, to sprinkle through everyday people and why tackling gerrymandering matters. Thank you, Jen. I was changing the baby. 
Um, so I'm just honored, first of all, just to even be on this call about gerrymandering. Um, a lot of my work with the league lately is around voter service, and that's what I really love to do. So let me just kind of share with you all how I was kind of introduced to what this whole issue was. I was not aware that I was in a gerrymandered district. Um, one of our league members had put on an event to explain what gerrymandering was in, in probably about 2018. And she was sharing with us the work she did with um, Common Cause and all the organizations that we partnered with at that time. And I wasn't aware that our maps were drawn in such a way that it was so unfair and the way I looked at it, from my point of view, because I didn't know what gerrymandering was, was that it created an unfair environment where people could win the election um, off rip. <laughs> so to me, um, as someone who is all about voters' rights and all about voter services, um, I look at it as unfair. I look at it as a way to discourage voter participation which I think is awful. Um, and I, But the work that we have done and the work that I'm seeing here tonight excites me because it gives me hope that we're making change, that the people are getting active and we're making change and we are um, going to recreate the map in such a way that it represents the people and the interests of the people and their votes. So I'm really excited about this um, and watching how these maps are coming together is really cool actually and i'm looking forward to what this work is going to do for the next 10 years so thank you so much for having me thank you desiree now i get to introduce the goddess of goodness uh catherine terser who has been uh league's most valued partner for decades money and politics gerrymandering all the things um, so honored to get to work with you on this issue, and I'm thrilled that we'll be working on this together next year, Catherine. Well, I have to say, I feel like I have been waiting for an eon to actually get to 2021 and new maps. And so you know, today is really a little of this and a little of that. Um, and, and so my section really is, it's now time for us to slay the gerrymander again. And yes, we pushed and we won and passed state legislative redistricting reform in 2015 and we collected signatures so that the state house actually took us seriously and established new rules that will be in place for map making um, in this upcoming year um, but now i bet you all are here and you want to actually do something and so the first thing that i wanted to highlight that you could in fact do just today and Nazik, if you'll move the slide along, um, you know, we ta we've talked about this before, the end gerrymandering pledge, um, but I would encourage all of us to do what we can so that we get our, the folks that are the map makers on record and actually make sure that they understand, even if they don't take the end gerrymandering pledge, but that they understand that we expect them to do better, that we've in fact went through this whole process and then we wanna actually come out of this knowing that our map makers are actually focused on us, on the voters. Now, one of the things that happened uh, as we were you know, having this conversation is someone sent me information about you know, an un-gerrymandered district on, on, on uh, the West shore of, of Cleveland. And you know, that's really like, what we really want is to make sure that our communities are well representative well represented so we have good representation at the state house and in congress and if you're willing to move to the next slide the other thing that i really wanted to highlight as we as we go through this is there's some other kind of transparency pieces that we need to actually be doing as well the first has to do with okay we know we're going into this map making period we also know that the pandemic is continuing to go on and you know what? I don't want to go to the state house. We know that there literally was a state rep who went after he had tested positive for COVID to committee hearings. And so one of the things that we really need to do is we need to call right now for greater transparency 
Um, and that means the ability to test, testify virtually. And so Tiffany's going to uh, pop in information because we really need to do everything we possibly can to create as transparent a, a process so that when we go through this timeline, when we go through 2021, we're doing what we can so we have access to information and so that we also have the ability to influence the process. So I encourage you today to actually take action and call for legislature to actually pass you know, pass a bill that allows us all to testify from a distance so that we can remain healthy. The other thing I wanted to highlight is that we can also undo today is we can call on the legislature to pass the Jim Siegel Disclosure Bill. So many of you will remember Jim, wonderful reporter at the Columbus Dispatch. He passed away last year, um, age 44, and he was a really wonderful proponent of open government. And what, what we do know, one of the obstacles to not just redistricting, um, but to all sorts of things at the state house is that the, the information that is created at the Legislative Service Commission, these are the folks, this is the nonpartisan agency that is tasked with researching and developing bills and creating amendments. All of those records are not part of the public record, meaning we can't get easy access to it. And we also know the congressional maps are bills. They're, they are introduced as bills. They're passed into law through the legislature. And we really need to get access to that information. And it's been 20 years since we've had good access to the Legislative Service Commission. And so you know, I'm going to urge you all, Tiffany will throw it into the, into the link just to say, hey, you know, we need to actually get that type of disclosure. Now, I threw out this you know, timeline here so you would have a sense of what we're actually talking about. I do wanna highlight that we may be really waiting on the census, um, but that really the, the serious map making for the state legislature tasked, you know, tasked with Congress and for, um, for the folks that are, are tasked with the state legislative map, that's the Ohio Redistricting Commission, that we're talking about deadlines that are in the fall. And so I just wanted to highlight that there are multiple deadlines because, um, how can I put this? Uh, when we passed issue one of May, 2018, it was a compromise. And what they were trying to do was come up with ways to encourage good map making and bipartisan map making. But at the end of the day, they said, okay, we'll arm wrestle with this. We'll try it in this, we'll try it, try it in the legislature. And if that doesn't work, we're gonna try it um, with um, the Ohio Redistricting uh, Commission. And if that doesn't work, we're at the point where, oh, we still are just butting heads and we can't actually get it done. Then we're gonna do a four year map. And so as we think about those timelines, we're going to need to be engaged throughout that process what I should highlight to you before you know you start to say, okay, wait a second, all of a sudden you get to the last one and it's a four-year map. That four-year map includes you know, stricter rules. And the rule that I think is the most important is they have to explain their maps in writing, which then makes it much easier to challenge in a court of law if we don't like it. Now, as we think about these details, it's important to think about, well, what will we be doing? And so if you'll go to the next slide, Nazak. So what are we gonna do? You know, yes, there are things that we can do today to encourage transparency, but as we go into 2021, we're gonna have a time period in the winter and the spring um, where we can learn to use these, use these mapping tools. I, you know, I, I thought it was really fun today to think about, well, wait a second, how would this work? And if we had a little more time to kind of dig in. Um, and it's important for all of us to consider becoming citizen map makers so that we can think about our communities. There was a question in the chat that, that had to do with like school districts and that notion of keeping school districts together. And I can think of a house district in Columbus where a school district was completely divided and just this really weird wiggle. And so having conversations about, well, what communities do we need to get to each other? How do we need to keep things together and preparing so that we can actually testify in the fall? 
We're also going to be doing uh, a redistricting competition. Many of us will remember the one in 2011 um, where we did state legislative districts and we did congressional districts. And it really was an opportunity for folks to say, hey, I can do better than the map makers. And it also provided, how can I say, so a little bit of information so that when it came time for the League of Women Voters to challenge the maps in court, they were able to say, hey, there are, the citizen map makers were able to do much better. And so as we think about kind of going into the public hearing, some of us are gonna to wanna to do letters to the editor. Some of us are gonna to wanna to attend and just push for greater transparency. And some of us are gonna to wanna to do a deep dive into drawing some districts. And now, you know, as we think about kind of the next steps, I'm hoping that you all, all join me in some more webinars where we learn lots and lots of things beginning in, in January of 20, 2021. And so with that, Janet, do you have a bunch of questions for me? Yes, I do. The first is, when would the Ohio Redistricting Commission be announced? So obviously, we know some of those individuals now, but some of them we don't. So generally, they are announced early in the year. Um, I suspect, and I suspect this time, that um, the Speaker of the House is going to actually want to be the person that, it, you know, he could, in fact, identify someone to represent him. But I think, you know, when you think about it, it's more likely that both the Democrat and Republican that are the leaders in both chambers, the Ohio House and the Ohio Senate, I think they're very likely to want to do it themselves. This is, you know, the, the Ohio Registering Commission is in fact a new entity. And I could imagine they might want to appoint people or they might actually want to do it themselves. And so then we also have the governor, the auditor, and the secretary of state. And then we have two members from the Ohio House and two members, D, R, and then two members from the Ohio Senate. And once again, D and R. So I'm seeing a lot of questions that are kind of, I've, I've heard the term natural gerrymandering, which doesn't actually exist. Gerrymandering is, is really intentionally trying to make maps um, and partisan gerrymandering intentionally make maps that favor one party over another. Can you talk about how some districts will remain probably solidly Republican or solidly Democrat? So what do we really mean as we think about a fair map? So, so the way to think about this is there are areas of the state of Ohio that are dominated by Republicans. And a district that is dominated by Republicans just makes sense. That's not a gerrymander. That's just a district that's representative of that community. Now, when you manipulate things so that you have, uh, let's, let's take the duck district or, uh, you know, district, congressional district four with, you know, with its, its beak, let's put its beak up in Oberlin and then it works its way down so that it's actually from Lake Erie and shaking its tail feathers on the Indiana border in the middle of the state. Um, that, you know, when, when we think about gerrymandering, you know, ugly is as ugly does, of course, um, but those really ugly districts that divide communities and are intended to favor one political party over another are different than, okay, you have a democratic district that's smack dab in the center of Columbus. Well, that's just the way that would be. David, did you wanna say something about this? If I can unmute myself, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, you know, there, the notion is not that every district can magically be made competitive. If you know, if that were our goal, we'd wind up with crazy shapes, just different crazy shapes. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, uh, North, uh, you know, uh, Northwest Ohio has a has a political identity, and it's going to be represented if you draw you know, draw a map true to it. And just as, as Catherine said, a map drawn to reflect Columbus's politics is going to produce a democratic seat. But what's different, and I've, I've done this in class with my students, what's different is if you don't set out to draw a skewed map, you know, what you wind up with is a collectively competitive map. So it's not that every district in this case will likely have 15. It's not that all 15 
will be competitive. It's that you're very unlikely if you actually, you know, hold communities together and don't systematically divide counties, you're very unlikely to get a map that's so wildly skewed from the overall vote. So within that new map, you're going to have some very competitive races. You're going to have some safe Democratic seats, some safe Republican seats, but you're going to have a map that votes a lot more like Ohio than what we have right now. Great. So we've gotten a couple of questions about the Ohio Supreme Court. Would one of you like to talk about the role that the Ohio Supreme Court could play? Well, I think with uh, Rucha v. Common Cause, when they were saying, okay, um, the Supreme Court basically was like, it is not under the purview of the federal courts. Well, that means that our maps are under the purview of the Ohio Supreme Court. And so, you know, one of the, the benefits of this past election is we have a slightly more balanced, you know, they're more Republicans than Democrats, but a more balanced Ohio Supreme Court. And the Ohio Supreme Court is the court that will determine whether, you know, and this is both the state legislative maps, the Ohio House and the Ohio Senate maps, and the congressional maps, whether they actually meet the rules in the Ohio Constitution. And so that is, that is the court of record here. David, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, yeah, I just want to underscore, you know, what the U.S. Supreme Court did was really kind of hold its nose and say, we don't really want to see these cases, but it absolutely leaves the door for state courts to scrutinize maps. And the role of our court only gets more important with the reforms because they're in a position to help, you know, help enforce the vision of the reform if the legislature uh, finds itself unwilling to, uh, uh, or unable to take steps in that direction. And I do agree. I think, I think we'll have quite a fascinating court because effectively uh, there'll be you know, three rather conservative justices, three rather liberal justices, and the chief justice will be in a very unique position um, to, to really see her vision of, of the court you know, enacted on gerrymandering and other issues. Uh, there are a lot of reference sources that show what's happened in Ohio. I really suggest that you check out the Fair Districts, our Fair Districts website, as well as the League's website, where we've been publishing data and research on this for a long time. Two really quick questions, because we're supposed to be wrapping up now. Um, Browns game is starting for some. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe not everyone's a Browns fan. But um, two, when might we know if we lose a congressional seat would be the first one? David. I, I mean, formally, we'll know, you know, in about a month. Informally, um, it's hard to come up with a scenario where we're not going to lose a seat. Got it. Okay. And I had another one and I've lost it. Maybe I can try to find it again. Um, well, let's just do this. Let's, oh, I know what it is. It's lots of people are thinking about this concept of community, right? And, and clearly, the concept of community is absolutely squishy. Um, and so I'm going to make a comment and then I think it would be great for each of you to make a comment. My comment would be, we certainly know what community is not. You know, the, for example, the snake on the lake where you've split a piece of Cleveland and a piece of Toledo, clearly it's a far more representative community to keep Toledo with Toledo and Cleveland with Cleveland, right? So can you talk just a little bit more about why it's important to think about communities of interest, why we want the public to be participating and trying to define their sense of community, and maybe how you define community. I think Suzanne should take this. <laughs> I was going to say those are really good questions and really hard questions, right? Because community is squishy and it's kind of supposed to be, right? This is not, there's so much of redistricting that is metrics and numbers and population and, you know, lines and GIS files. Community is about story, right? So I think that that's, that to me is the big distinction. Um, and there's also communities within communities, right? So like, your town may be your community, or it may be like the four blocks around you. Or a lot of times when I talk about communities of interest or community mapping, use the example of grocery stores, right? Everyone in my community, so I live somewhere where there are two major grocery stores, same chain that are in two different directions. The 
people that go to one grocery store are just a fundamentally different community than the people who go to the other. I couldn't tell you why that decision has been made, but like that's just the way it works. And so thinking about kind of those qualitative pieces like that, I think it's how we shape the conversation. As far as why community is important, I wanna think again about kind of those qualitative needs, right? So um, think about the things that your community needs that might not come from a statewide piece. So funding for parks in your community or road repairs in your community, or um, maybe your community has uh, a troubled education system, but next door, everything is peach king, right? And you want your community to be able to advocate as a whole um, for those resources. And you want the people that you elect to be able to advocate on your behalf. Additionally, and I think that this is something that I'm talking about more and more, it's the ability to elect someone who shares your lived experience, right? So it's not necessarily, and you know, you are not entitled to elect anyone, to be very clear. Like the law doesn't say that, the constitution doesn't say that. You're not entitled to elect anyone. You're not entitled for your person to be the one that gets elected, but you should have an equal opportunity to elect someone who shares your lived experience. And we know that when communities are kept together, they are more able to make their collective voices heard and send people to represent them who look like them, who think like them. And when we get those diverse voices into our representative bodies, into our legislatures, into our Congress, decision-making at that level is fundamentally better and fundamentally better for those people who are so often underrepresented. So it's a multi-step process that starts with being able to tell the story of your community. Thank you. I keep thinking I've always been really happy about our reforms because they focus on keeping you know, communities together, counties whole, townships whole. You know, it's a proxy for community and it's not a perfect one. Um, and certainly getting more additional information from the people that, you know, their lived experience is very exciting to me. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm so looking forward to taking a deep dive into the mapping tool. I just, you know, really appreciate this. Great. Dr. Niven, I know you look about it, you look at it in terms of maybe um, the economics of communities, uh, you know, maybe the physical geography of communities. So I'd love to hear your perspective on some of the things you think about as you define community. Well, I, I do think there's an important, you know, economic piece to this. You know, you, I use the example of the 15th district and Steve Stivers. You know, it's very hard to represent uh, Fortune 500 CEOs and you know, service workers in Vinton County, you know, in anything that you do. Um, you know, part of what I would encourage folks to think about is, you know, if you can describe your district as a meaningful place, you know, then it represents communities. If you can't, if it's just a list, well, it's this and then it's that and then it turns this way, it's not representing communities. And, you know, one of the, um, really fascinating pieces of, of research on this. Uh, there was a political scientist, he's, he's since passed away, but he spent his entire career following members of Congress around in their districts. And one of the conclusions he came to was watching, watching members do their job was, members can do an exceptional job of representing a community back home, but they can't create a community back home. If you give them a district of dis, you know, of dissimilar uh, uh, places and dissimilar people, they can't create a community out of nothing. And so, you know, I would encourage folks, you know, to think about if they can describe their place and describe a district, that's the direction of a community. If you can't, then you're just, it's just math. You're just putting people together for the purposes of, 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 of you know, election districts. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So a couple of questions we've had, Speakers Bureau. All right, in 2012, probably a lot of you remember that we 
failed over and over. We call it failing forward in trying to bring reforms to the people. The league started working against gerrymandering after the apportionment board was uh, established in 1967. And for decades, we're trying to bring these reforms to the people. In 2012, we were unsuccessful at the ballot. You know, my dear friend, Ann Hankener says that one of the things we did to make the difference to get to the 2015 reforms for the state legislative maps um, was a speaker's bureau where we armed our volunteers with PowerPoints and they went to communities across the state, you know, rotary clubs and, and church groups and, and scouting troops and schools to explain why maps matter and why gerrymandering is a problem. And that helped pave the way to a win with the voters. So once again, speaker's bureau will be about grabbing a lot of you who know how to talk to the public about government affairs. That's what we do at Common Cause and League. We demystify government and, and we will um, uh, be training you and hoping that you will educate the public on the map making process. And why? Because we believe that now is our job to remind map makers that we are watching and that we care and to make sure that they feel accountability to not just the letter of those reforms, but the spirit, which is really about fairness and bipartisanship. The map contest, you know, again, you'll be able to create just a district or an entire map. Um, and we want why a district? Maybe because we'll get a, a, a group of fifth graders who do it. Maybe we'll have um, a college class do it um, all the way to the full maps. Again, because bringing people into the process can be transformational. Advocacy to lawmakers, all of the different pieces. So please make sure that you sign the end gerrymandering pledge that signs you up to be part of our team of league and common causers who are gonna be working on this and it's our number one priority next year. There is hope because here we can, we are tenacious people. If there's one thing I know about our members and our organizations is that we will not stop until we bring fair maps to the people and now is our time to shine. And with that, um, know that we will send you the uh, links, we'll send you, uh, you know, the video, we'll send you the PowerPoint, and you'll be hearing from us uh, soon with more programming like this. And in the meantime, I just want to thank every single person who took the time to attend tonight and all of our speakers because this was just a beautiful choir um, from many different perspectives coming together for the people. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have thank a good evening. Again. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank you again, Dan, Suzanne, Alex. I so appreciate it. Happy Desiree, holidays, you are everyone. awesome. And we loved hearing your baby in the background too, Miss Desiree. <laughs> and happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for having me. Bye, everybody.